From the Las Vegas Review Journal Studio, welcome to Season 2 of Mobbed Up, The Fight for Las Vegas, presented by Pro Group Management. Additional sponsorship provided by El Cortez and the Golden Steer. A heads up before we get started. Mobbed Up contains explicit content such as strong language and depictions of violence, including murder. Please be advised that this podcast might not be suitable for all audiences. On the evening of April 27, 1998, there's a buzzing, almost festive sound on the Las Vegas Strip outside the Hard Luck Aladdin Hotel. Something big is going down. Television news helicopters are hovering above, and an estimated 20,000 onlookers have gathered on the streets. About 800 people paid $250 for a ringside seat under a VIP tent. It is the final chapter of the troubled resort that was controlled by the mob two decades earlier, then rescued by a big-name entertainer, only to fall into financial ruin and eventually disappear from the Strip skyline. This is the place where Elvis Presley married the love of his life, where organized crime built a high-tech theater that became the center of the Strip concert scene and where Wayne Newton, the Midnight Idol, once had the power to sign the paychecks. But in the end, the Aladdin was a failure. It couldn't recover from the days of pillaging under the Detroit and St. Louis crime families in the 1970s. Before he died in December 2020, longtime Las Vegas accountant George Swartz, who served on the Nevada Gaming Commission during those days, said the Aladdin never really had a chance. What a shame. You know, what a shame. It could have been so much better, but it just didn't work. And after the mob was gone from it, the people that tried to fix it just didn't have any luck. It's like it was uh, cursed. At 7.30 p.m. on that April evening, after organized crime had been cleaned out and after years of financial instability, the Aladdin was put out of its misery. Its 17-story hotel tower came tumbling down in a coordinated implosion. There were fireworks, flashing cameras, and cheers from the crowds. A billowing cloud of dust rose to the sky as the Aladdin was reduced to rubble. Its lonely marquee with the words, Aladdin Rises Anew, could be seen through the maze of dust. A review journal story described the structure seemingly hesitating, like a cartoon character falling off the edge of a cliff before dropping to the ground. The owners had hope of a rebirth with a new $1.3 billion gaming complex. But the ghost of the mob was still there. Left standing was another piece of the Aladdin's past, its theater for the performing arts. The high-tech concert venue, financed by mafia-controlled Teamsters pension fund money, would become the heart of a new and bigger Aladdin. I'm Jeff Gehrman, an investigative reporter with the Las Vegas Review Journal. In partnership with the Mob Museum, I'm your guide for season two of Mobbed Up, The Fight for Las Vegas, a true story about money. And so it was their piggy bank. They had the ability to get loans for whoever they wanted to get loans for. He just hit us like a tidal wave. Crime. You're in with every gangster and hoodlum in the United States. I don't go for that, Mr. Kennedy. Yeah. I don't go for that kind of action. I emptied that revolver in his head, then he still was alive. And the battle to control the strip. I was on television accused of fronting for the mob. We were very angry and very upset, and we knew we had been double-crossed. I was really worried about the state of Nevada because uh, it, it was on trial also. I've covered organized crime from the streets to the boardrooms of the Strip for more than 40 years. In season two, I'll take you on a fascinating journey as the FBI and state of Nevada take on the mob families. Federal judges battle prosecutors and two of the biggest names in entertainment fight for the right to replace the mob on the strip.
If you want to know what ignited the campaign to push the mob off the strip, you probably should start with the Aladdin. With all of its troubles, the resort may be as important to the history of Las Vegas as any of the casinos run by organized crime. Michael Green, a history professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, says other mob-managed casinos, like the Stardust, drew more public attention than the Aladdin over the years. Martin Scorsese's movie Casino is one example. The plot centered around the fictional casino, The Tangiers, which was really the Stardust. When we look at the Aladdin, in a way, it's the mob-controlled casino we don't notice as much as we should because the Stardust ended up being depicted in Casino. There, there was a certain involvement that included glamour and violence that you don't see with the Aladdin. But the Aladdin is a great case study. The clean operation that becomes dirty, that then is rescued, but even then, the Aladdin was never the financial success that the Stardust was, that some of the other mob-involved operations were, for whatever set of reasons. So the Aladdin may be the, the little engine that couldn't, but is also the little engine we should pay attention to. Federal authorities may not have fully recognized the significance of the indictment they obtained in 1978, charging Aladdin hotel executives and a Detroit bail bondsman in a scheme to unlawfully manage the Las Vegas casino for the Detroit mob. The executives were convicted a year later, setting off a firestorm of actions by both the feds and the state against the mafia on the Strip. Just a few years later, poof, the mob disappeared from the Strip just like the Aladdin. Former Justice Department Strike Force attorney Stan Hunterton, who prosecuted that case in Detroit, realized the importance of exposing the mafia at the Aladdin. At the end of the day, we got to where we were going, which was largely eradicating the organized crime influence in the uh, Las Vegas casinos. It had a profound effect, big change in how casinos were run and managed and who was profiting from them. I believe that Las Vegas would have in the years, say, since the mid-1980s, outgrown the mafia just because things were becoming more respectable. Banks were getting involved in lending. And most importantly, the casino business simply outgrew the mafia. By the mid-1980s, federal and state officials had cleaned up most of the strip. Mafia leaders in Chicago, Kansas City, Milwaukee, and Cleveland were convicted of skimming from strip casinos. And the Chicago mob's overseer here, Anthony Spilatro, wound up murdered gangland style. David Helfrey, chief of the Justice Department's organized crime strike force in Kansas City at the time, led the prosecution of the skimming cases involving the Stardust and Tropicana hotels. As far as I can tell, that casino case was about the biggest organized crime case that had come down. We took four mafia families, the leadership of all four of them, we took their Las Vegas representatives and significantly hurt the mafia, particularly I know in Kansas City. And the results speak for themselves. I mean, the Kansas City mob never used to do drugs. They're reduced to gambling and drug dealing on a relatively small scale, frankly, is what I'm told by the FBI. And, you know, we took all our leadership down. There was nobody left of any stature when we were done with Kansas City. We took the top three or four people from Chicago down, took the second in command, Angelo Leonardo from Cleveland, and we took down uh, Frank Ballesteri from Milwaukee. I don't think we eliminated Chicago since it was a very large mob, but Teamsters fund got cut off from them, and none of the mobs could get money that way again. Federal prosecutors took nearly two more decades to charge the Detroit mob's leadership with hidden interests in the Aladdin. But they did it with a splash. Giacomo Blackjack Toco and brothers Vito and Anthony Giacalone were among the 17 top La Cosa Nostra members named in a sweeping indictment in 1996. It included allegations of extortion, 
racketeering, and infiltrating Las Vegas casinos. The aging mob leaders were also charged with wielding influence at the frontier in the 1960s and later the Edgewater Hotel on the Colorado River in Laughlin after the Detroit crime family lost its grip at the Aladdin. Detroit journalist and mafia watcher Scott Bernstein has chronicled the saga of the Edgewater. Immediately after getting booted out of the Aladdin, like within months, one of their guys in the Aladdin, a guy by the name of Bill Pompili, who was tied into the Detroit mob, was kind of the architect of the entire operation. It was his brainchild. He went to Jack Toko and certain other members of the Detroit mob hierarchy and said, you know, you guys have had issues here on the Strip in Las Vegas, but what if we moved operations to Laughlin? kind of away from the prying eyes of the Las Vegas law enforcement and kind of go out there and, and be kind of a, uh, a one-man show out there because at that point there, there really wasn't a lot of high-end casino gambling out in Laughlin. So he came up with the whole idea. He drew up the blueprints for what the casino was going to look like. And for the next two years, they were plotting and planning that and got in bed with, I believe, both the Chicago outfit via Spilatro, as well as the Buffalo organized crime family, the Magadino crime family, and built the Edgewater. It opened in 1981, and in a matter of, like, less than a year, they stole $10 million and got out. Long before the federal indictment against the Detroit mob bosses, gaming regulators had quietly dealt with the crime family's connections at the Edgewater. They forced casino executives and key stockholders to leave the company. Circus Circus Enterprises bought the resort in 1983. Regulators had learned the importance of keeping an eye on the Detroit mob. Following the Detroit convictions in 1979, the Aladdin provided another gaming milestone. It was the first time the state moved to close a major casino because of organized crime connections. Gaming historian David Schwartz says it was a huge move for regulators. This was a pretty major moment, and it was something that traditionally the gaming regulators have not wanted to close properties. I think this is really a measure of last resort for them, so it shows just how seriously they were taking this. Robert List, who was governor in that era, recalls how furious he was when federal judge Harry Claiborne overruled the state's decision in 1979 to shut down the Aladdin Casino after the Detroit convictions. Claiborne was the one, of course, who kept the Aladdin open when it was mobbed up, and it was very apparent that the place was not operated by clean people. So that did it for me with Claiborne, but we had to fight like crazy. It took months, but Nevada prevailed. A higher court eventually ordered Claiborne to give up control of the casino. Wayne Newton and longtime gaming executive Ed Torres bought the Aladdin in 1980 after some stiff competition from NBC late night host Johnny Carson. Both Newton and Torres were licensed by the state in September of that year. But their stint at the helm together lasted less than two years. The two had disagreements over how to run the joint, and in July 1982, Tories bought out Newton. Under Tories, the Aladdin filed for bankruptcy about 18 months later after it fell behind in paying back an old $34 million loan from the Teamsters Central States Pension Fund. The resort had a series of other owners, including Japanese businessman Genji Yasuda, but it continued to have financial difficulties through the 1980s and 1990s. Yasuda was forced out after gaming regulators voiced concerns about millions of dollars in reported loans he had gotten from a Japanese businessman tied to mobsters. Years later, the curse continued. The new Aladdin, built on the ruins of the old resort, would also fail. In 2003, it wound up in the hands of Planet Hollywood, its namesake today. Coming up, despite the embarrassment of alleged ties to the mob and going through a bitter legal fight to clear his name, Wayne Newton is surprisingly upbeat about his days of owning the Aladdin. We'll be back after a break.
you would think that having the opportunity to buy a casino on the famed Las Vegas Strip would be a great experience. For Wayne Newton, that wasn't exactly the case. Days after getting his casino license, NBC News aired a report tying him to a couple of mafia figures. He also received death threats and filed what became an epic lawsuit against NBC to restore his reputation. The litigation lasted a decade, long after he gave up his stake in the Aladdin. In 1992, he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy to reorganize some $20 million in debts and recovered financially several years later. And yet today, Newton has fond memories about the Aladdin. I can't pass the Aladdin without calling it the Aladdin, for example. And I can't, I can't sit in that showroom and watch a show without all of those thoughts and memories coming back. And they weren't all terrible. You know, those were tough times and tough to even talk about to this day. But some good came from it. Newton recalls offering help after the November 21st, 1980 fire at the MGM Grand Hotel that killed 87 people and injured hundreds more. It was one of the deadliest fires in the nation's history. Billionaire Kirk Kerkorian was the largest shareholder in the company. Right after I had gotten my license is when the MGM fire happened. And I remember standing out in front of the Aladdin and seeing people on the roof of what is now Bally's with no place to go, trying to figure out how they're going to get off the roof and will there be enough helicopters. And I remember calling Mr. Kerkorian and I said, having just got my license, we can go ahead and open the hotel, even though we're not ready for gaming. So please, all of the people that do not have a room to go back to as a result of this terrible tragedy, please send them over here. They will be my guest. And so there were some good thoughts and moments that came from that too. One thing Newton took away from being a casino owner is how much he values being an entertainer. I think that I realized through all of this that what I love doing the most is trying to bring happiness into people's lives. And uh, if I had to go through that kind of pain, I'd do it again. And I'm sure it would be the same outcome because performing is what I love doing, not owning or running a place or worrying about getting the calls from my partner saying, we have to put up an extra two million today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Those kind of calls are a little tough. <laughs> Those days bring back memories for Newton's good friend, former governor Robert List. With the help of the feds, List and gaming regulators made terrific strides in kicking the mob out of the strip. But they made one big mistake. List says the main blemish during his tenure in the war against organized crime was not fully rooting out the mob's hold on the Stardust and Fremont hotels. The state forced the Argen Corporation, which was owned by Chicago Mafia frontman Alan Glick, to sell the Stardust and Fremont. But as it turned out, the new owners the state approved, longtime businessmen Alan Sachs and Herb Tolman, had failed to stop the mob from skimming casino funds. And we thought they were clean, and it turned out they weren't, that they still had hidden ownership other than them. Former U.S. Senator Richard Bryan was Nevada's attorney general then. The FBI had shared information about Sachs and Tobin, but because the investigation was not complete, they could not publicly use it. So the deputy attorneys general in the gaming division recommended to the gaming control board to give Sachs and Tobin a limited one-year license. The control board voted for a one-year limited license, but the Nevada Gaming Commission, in a controversial decision, reversed the board and gave Saxon Tobman an unconditional license. News reports at the time revealed that board member Richard Bunker, who was loyal to List, had some private conversations with commission members before they voted. Bunker voted with the control board majority for the limited license, but reportedly told gaming commissioners that he had no objections to an unconditional license. 
The word was that then control board chairman Roger Trounde, an appointee of the previous administration, ended up resigning after feeling that he was backdoored by Bunker. Publicly, Trounde told the media there was no friction between him and Bunker. When Trounde left, List named his man Bunker as chairman. A few years later, Bryan defeated List in the governor's race, and during his administration, Sachs and Tobman were heavily fined and lost their casino license. They sold the two properties to the well-established Boyd Gaming Group. Bunker died in March 2019. To this day, Trouty won't discuss why he left the Gaming Control Board, but he does say he didn't feel good about being overridden by the Gaming Commission on the Sachs and Tobin licensing. We basically felt that we weren't comfortable that that was a total separation of who was involved in there. So we only gave Sachs and Tobin a provisional license which we felt would keep the burden on them to prove that they were legitimate in their operation of that. Trondi says the state's task of going after the mob was complicated. Some of the people had kind of worked themselves into being part of the community. And so there were elements of the community that supported what we were doing. And there were some that felt like we were overstepping our bounds in a lot of ways. And so there was some tension. At the same time, there was distrust between federal authorities and the state that had to be overcome. We were the only state that had gaming, and so we were kind of self-contained and dealing with our own issues, and uh, we never dealt really with outside agencies, and eventually it came to realize that because we didn't have subpoena authority or wiretap authority and that sort of thing, that we did need some help. Still ahead, the feds may have had more resources in the campaign against the mob, but the state made a quick comeback with the help of a secret weapon. Mobbed Up, The Fight for Las Vegas, Season 2, continues after a word from our sponsors. Your time is important to you, so it is important to us, too. As a business owner, you want to spend your time focused on growing your business, not on dealing with red tape you can safely leave that to us. At Pro Group Management, we focus on ensuring that you have the best workers' comp plan for your business. Our team of experts keeps up on all the regulatory issues and compliance updates so you can spend your time growing your business. For self-insured groups, Pro Group Management is the leader in providing Nevada's businesses with reliable, quality workers' comp programs. And we have the awards to prove it. Find out how to have Pro Group Management work for you. Visit our website at pgmnv.com to receive a free cost savings analysis now. That's pgmnv.com or call our Las Vegas office at 702-740-4380. Pro Group Management. Workers comp that works for you. Hey you, you know the mob history of El Cortez in downtown Las Vegas? No? Some mob fan you are. El Cortez is where mob legends like Bugsy Siegel, Maya Lansky, and Moe Sedway got their start in 1945. Today, El Cortez is the only hotel casino on the National Register of Historic Places, and that vintage Vegas feeling is still alive and well. They've got new classically modern rooms, 33% looser slots in the strip, and great dining and cocktails. Everything Vegas was built on. So come play where the legends play at El Cortez. Can't get enough of the intrigue, drama, and excitement behind the history of Las Vegas? Live it by dining at the Golden Stair Steakhouse, the oldest steakhouse in Las Vegas and an old haunt of Tony Spilatro's. The Golden Stair has been serving up famous and infamous customers since 1958. From mobsters to the Rat Pack, Muhammad Ali to Holly Madison. Enjoy this classic experience in person or try their world-famous best steaks on earth in the comfort of your own home by ordering today at goldensteerlasvegas.com. Great news for all fans and followers of Mobbed Up, the Fight for Las Vegas podcast. Just for listening, you can enter to win one of these Mobbed Up Season 2 fabulous prizes. Prize number one, two nights stay and a $50 credit at Siegel's 1941 at El Cortez. Prize number two, $250 gift card to Golden Steer Steakhouse. Prize number three, four passes to the Mob Museum. For more information and to enter, go to lvrj.com backslash mob giveaway. Bud Hicks was the number two man in the Nevada Attorney General's office in the late 1970s. 
He saw firsthand how the state and the federal government came together, despite a natural tension, to take out the mob. The feds were very methodical. I give great credit to the federal strike forces of what they did with the Tropicana and Latin cases and everything else that they did in the 70s. Looking at it with an educated eye, you can see that the relationships between the federal authorities and the state authorities, you know, gradually developed, increased, improved, and really became uh, very functional in the 80s. One of the weapons that gave both Nevada and the feds a boost was a 1960 law that allowed regulators to put people who were considered threats to gaming on an exclusive list that barred them from entering casinos. It was called the Black Book. Some of the notorious underworld figures put on the list included Chicago Mafia boss Sam Giancana, Kansas City mob kingpins Nick and Carl Savella, and of course, the Chicago mob's men in Las Vegas, Anthony Spalatro and Frank Rosenthal. The Black Book, in terms of legal process, is even less than a licensing hearing. At least in a licensing hearing, you have a right to appear and present evidence and make your case. But in a Black Book situation, the commission could just put people in the Black Book because they were identified as unsuitable people. And that's what they did. Its constitutionality was challenged over the years by many on the list. But for the most part, the Black Book survived and became an effective tactic against the mob. It really shook things up. The feds appreciated that. Former Gaming Commission member George Swartz said the Black Book was a valuable process for the state. We took it very seriously and tried to deal with people that were candidates for the Black Book based on evidence and fairness. But the folks that were put in the Black Book were not happy, to say the least. And it was pretty tense and unpleasant. But, um, you know, we did it. Today, there are 35 members in the Black Book, mostly gaming cheats. The state doesn't use it as much as it did in the mob days. As Nevada went after organized crime, a state law created in the late 1960s, the Corporate Gaming Act, provided another boost. The act was passed by the legislature as Howard Hughes began buying up casinos on the Strip in the 1960s, like the Desert Inn and Frontier. With streamlined licensing regulations, big corporations like Hughes's were able to get funding and purchase casinos. That was the salvation of Las Vegas. So we've had a few bumps along the road, but generally speaking, the corporate gaming has saved us. That was former U.S. Senator Harry Reid, who chaired the Nevada Gaming Commission in the late 1970s. Richard Bryan says the act led to the Wall Street casino ownership we have today and gave more legitimacy to the industry. It's much harder for organized crime to get a piece of a big corporation. When corporate gaming came in, they kind of gave the good housekeeping seal of approval. I mean, these major corporations that had business interests all over the world were not going to get involved in any kind of skimming operations. That was a positive development. In addition to that, because these large corporations also were regulated at the federal level, the SEC and other agencies had a monitoring role with respect to, to the federal aspect. Not that they regulated the casinos, but obviously the financial transactions were subject to federal scrutiny. George Swartz said Las Vegas is far better off today under the corporate umbrella. There's a lot of people that don't like the corporate gaming because they say, you know, you'll hear people even today saying, ah, town was better when the mob was running it. Well, not so. That's just not true. The corporate gamers don't bury people in shallow graves when they misbehave. And they deal with it in a legal and proper way. So it's a huge difference. And of course, now the major casinos are run by big corporations and the elements of good accounting and reporting the income and lack of skimming, all of those things, they're all done better because the gaming enforcement agencies are better at it and the corporate gamers are better at complying with the laws. But can the mob come back to the strip? Harry Reid won't take odds on that. They are so clever. Remember, we, we thought we had everything under control. George Swartz was willing to bet against the mob. It's very, very difficult because 
of all the transparencies involved and the stigma of having someone that's involved with a mob family. You know, the mob is still around. I mean, there are rackets being run in Las Vegas, but it's not, the casinos aren't owned by them anymore. Now they've got the side rackets, you know, drugs, prostitution, money laundering, loan sharking, all that kind of stuff. Brian says the Nevada gaming regulatory process has toughened up since the campaign against organized crime and become the gold standard for the world. We're very fortunate. We've had really no scandal in Nevada with respect to the gaming regulators themselves. I think that's remarkable. Let's hope it continues. Looking back, former Governor Robert Liss says the fight to save the Las Vegas Strip was difficult but successful. In the end, the state beat the odds. Nevada was enabled to continue to grow and to prosper and to attract capital from legitimate sources to expand and to bring in uh, reputable operators. And that's what's made possible the Nevada and Las Vegas of 2021. It's seen worldwide as a legitimate place to go. And in fact, it's probably the number one place in the world for people to come and have fun and know that they'll be treated honestly and fairly. It turned the corner. It absolutely turned the corner. This has been the last episode of season two of Mobbed Up, a production for the Las Vegas Review Journal in partnership with the Mob Museum. If you are enjoying it, Please subscribe to the series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Help us out by telling your friends and by leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. This series is reported by me, Jeff Gehrman. Field and audio recording by Larry Muir. And audio engineering by Greg Conway. Wayne Newton was interviewed by Review Journal columnist John Ketzalomitis. If you have feedback, email me at jgerman at reviewjournal.com. We would like to thank our Mobbed Up Season 2 presenting sponsor, Pro Group Management. Additional sponsorship provided by The Golden Steer and El Cortez.